a story is told of an apocryphal story of a terrible train accident in upstate New York where late at night a train came barreling along the tracks at a crossing, a car came up across the crossing, the train struck the car, and the driver of the car was killed. The widow of the driver brought a lawsuit against the railroad company claiming that they were negligent in not having proper warning devices at the crossing. The case came to trial, and the star witness for the railroad company was the watchman who was assigned to that crossing. He was called to the witness stand, he was sworn in, and the lawyer for the railroad company said, won't you tell us, in your own words, what happened on that fateful night? The watchman said, certainly. I was in my watchtower, night had fallen, I checked my timetable, I saw the train should be coming, and I looked down the tracks and I saw the headlamp of the train coming forward. I then looked down the road and in the distance I saw the headlights of a car coming. So I took my lantern and I left my guardhouse and I went to the street and I started waving my lantern to warn the car that the train was coming. And of course the train kept barreling on and to my consternation, the car appeared not to be slowing down. And now I was waving my lantern back and forth increasingly frantically, but to my horror, the driver ignored me. The car went up onto the crossing struck the train, and the driver was killed. Well, based on that testimony, the court found in favor of the railroad and found that they weren't negligent. After the trial, the railroad executives and the lawyers surrounded the watchman. They pounded him on the back. They shook his hand. They congratulated him. They said, you know, you were great. You won the case for us. And you didn't even seem nervous. And with that, the watchman started to shake. And a tear came down his cheek, and he looked at them. He said, nervous? You say I wasn't nervous? I have to tell you that up on that witness stand, having taken an oath to God Almighty, I don't know what I would have answered had anyone asked me if my lantern was lit. So how often do we think that we're waving empty lanterns? How often are we going through the motions, dealing in form, and not in substance? Is it not an issue that we all ask ourselves? Is it not an issue that society asks us? The story of Jewish life has been the story of kindling our lanterns and waving them with meaning, and yet today we question that. Because perhaps for the first time, being Jewish today is an option and not a condition. No one is forcing us to be Jewish. And the real question that we have to confront is why, why should we exercise the option? And it seems to me that the only reason that we should exercise the option is if it gives us added value in fashioning a life that works, in fashioning a life that makes sense, in fashioning a life that matters. Now today, Jewish life will not transmit by osmosis. It's not something in our bones. It's not something we feel because our parents felt. I want to submit to you that the only way it's going to transmit is if we know our story and if we own our story. What do I mean? What do I mean when we say we have to know our story? First of all, I mean that we must be literate. It's not just out there in the ether. We have to be literate. We don't all need to be learned Jews. We do all need to be learning Jews because there's this story and we own it. And I think if we want to be part of that, then we have an obligation to have a serious immersion in serious Jewish ideas. And that requires Jewish education, not just sitting in a chair. Serious Jewish education through day school, through family education, through Maya, through Melton mini schools. We have to know our story, but we also have to own our story. And what do I mean by owning our story? I mean, we have to experience it. We have to bring passion to it. 
We are known as a people of deed, not a people of creed. We have no catechism. There's no word in the Torah for rights. Our prime word in the Torah is mitzvah, obligation, responsibility. We are a people of history, but we're a people of destiny. We're going somewhere. So it's not enough to just know. If we're not passionate about it, it doesn't work. If we don't act, it doesn't work. We can learn all we want to about the Sabbath, but without wine, without our children around us, without songs, without the light of candles, there's no Sabbath. We can have a simchat bat when our child is born, but it's not bagels and locks. It's the spirit that we bring to it. It's the way we own it. It's the passion we have. We can have a state of Israel. It can be a place, a point on a map, or it can be our sacred home and that of our forebears and that of our children. We have to get fired up about the story by owning the rituals, the totems and the taboos and making them ours. You know, a lot of people have a day school education, but frankly, if that day school education doesn't come with a sense of passion, doesn't come with a sense of ownership, doesn't come with a sense of experience, well, I'll tell you, it's still necessary, but it's just not sufficient. It doesn't work, it doesn't sustain. What are we supposed to do? I talk about you have to know the story and you have to own the story. So what do you do to know the story? So I have to tell you, you have to start at the beginning of the story. And you have to start with the first sentence of our story, of our Torah, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The G word, God, is essential for us to know our story. Because it's from the fact that we know there's a God, there's a prime mover, there's a creator, that we then know what it means when we're said we are created in the image of God and like God and in doing imitatio Dei and, and imitating what God does, we have rights and responsibilities. We know the values that I get to use in building a life. In knowing our story, I know what to do and how to do it, or at least I'm taught what to do and how to do it. I get to work through the philosophy. I get to identify with the life that came before me and the life that my children will learn and then own. It's about a shared mission. And as I learn the story, I learn about that shared mission. I learn about Hillel who said, Im ain on the mili. If I'm not for myself, who'll be for me? It's about me. But Hillel was smart enough to put a semicolon after that statement and said, Kesha anila atzmi, mo an ani. But in defining myself, if I'm only about me, what am I? That's the lesson from our story. And that same Hillel said to the stranger who said, teach me the Torah while standing on one leg. So Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to others. But that's not the end of what he said, because when you read the book, not the Marvel comics, his next line is, Zil Gamar. Now go and study. Now go and learn. And that's the essence, how we know the story. How do we own the story? How do we own the story? So for me, when I pray, when I pray, it has to be to someone. How did I, how did I think about praying? When I was eight years old, my father brought me two records by Theodore Bikel. Now your homework is to go and find your grandparents and ask them who Theodor Bukel was, an early, wonderful Jewish folk singer who's still alive and well and wonderful. But in Theodor Bukel's records about Yiddish music and the songs of Israel, I heard the voice of God. On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when I stood in my synagogue and Benjamin Gottlieb the cantor stood up in his white gown and high hat and then began singing in his baritone voice so loud that the windows of the shul shook I heard the soft, sweet voice of God. And when at 13, I lost my father. And I had a profound thought about what does this mean? So I had to be able to pray to my father in heaven so that I could maintain a relationship with my father in heaven. You own your story through an awareness of your values. 
through loving your Jewish rituals, however you make your Jewish rituals, but by loving them and informing it with your passion, by song that comes not just from your vocal cords, but from your soul, by reading where you're not reading the story of historical figures, but the story of members of your family. It's by exercising responsibility as part of your Jewish mandate, whether it's going to the five towns and Staten Island to help, to help fellow Jews and fellow humans in, in hurricane recovery, whether it's going with the American Jewish World Service on a trip to Nicaragua to recognize our opportunity and responsibility as Jews to make the world just a little better, whether it's participating in a birthright trip to our homeland, whether it's to celebrating Jewish life at Hillel, whether it's building your community at camp, whether it's being active with your federations, or whether it's celebrating Shabbat with those you love. All of that is ways that you own your story. So years ago, when I was working at Hillel, I ran a, uh, a program in Kamarova in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. And my colleague, Rabbi Yossi Goldman, felt bad that I didn't get a tour, I didn't get to see St. Petersburg. So he took me in a minivan to St. Petersburg, let me off on a bridge spanning the Neva River so I could take a picture of the Hermitage. As I'm standing there, this burly Russian with a big face, with two teeth, playing a balalaika, a Russian, a Russian guitar, walks over to me. He's playing Midnight in Moscow, and he says to me, Amerikansky, give money, give money. So I reached into my pocket, I gave him a few rubles, Frankly, I felt a little bit intimidated, so I turned to Yossi Goldman, and in Yiddish I said, Yossi, lummer gain, let's go. With that, the Russian kind of tensed up, and his face broke into a little bit of a grimace. And he looked at me and he said, Yevrei, Jew? And I looked at him diffidently, and I said, Da. And his face broke into this big toothless smile, and he said to me in Yiddish, Ich bin a Yid, I'm a Jew started playing by Mirbis Duchesne <laughs> and tried to give me back the money. Because Yiddish was our culture and it was the secret handshake that said that we shared a story that we knew and that we owned. But that story doesn't osmose. It has to be learned and it has to be earned. It requires love. It requires knowledge. It requires building a renewed people based on knowledge and passion so that we will exercise the option, a rich option. The challenge is to know our Jewish riches and to celebrate them through action. Then our lantern glows and then our people grows. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.